Hi, everybody. Another episode of Scholastic Lutherans. I'm Jared, and with me here is Tony. And today we're going to watch uh, some videos from a very serious Marian, and we're going to see, hey, how does he look to Mary, and how can we, according to him, be good Marians? Um, Tony, if you can, tell us a little bit about this guy. I'm going to pull up his what his YouTube channel is, and I will just show just his main page. But just give me one sec here. Okay, so this is a guy named Gabby After Hours. Tony, can you tell yep. us a bit about him? Sure, yeah. So <clears throat> Gabby After Hours, he is a uh, devout Roman Catholic YouTuber. Um, so he's uh, he originally started out as like a Catholic middle school teacher. Um, and then he after a while of finding out so many people so many catholics have been like leaving the faith or just not having a very robust faith he was like man how can i really get people on fire for the catholic church and he came across the works of a man named uh maximilian colby who is actually the profile picture of his channel maximilian mm -hmm. colby was i believe he was a monk or a friar um, but he was like really big and pushing like the uh, total consecration to Jesus through Mary, which is like a really big uh, consecratory uh, devotion practice in the Catholic Church. I mean, it's celebrated all throughout the world, like by thousands and thousands and thousands of people every year. Um, where the idea is to devote yourself to Mary, to get closer to Jesus, to become more holy, to become a saint, stuff like that. So he's really big on pushing his works and also the works of like Alphonsus de Liguori. Um, so that's kind of like his background. He's really big on promoting Marian devotion for holiness. That's, mm -hmm. that's this guy's whole mission. Yeah. And I thought I would say that uh, Alphonsus de Liguori is surely not a small name. Uh, Maximilian Colby, uh, he's also very big. There's uh, the Catholic Church, uh, one of the Catholic churches near me here in Minneapolis, Holy Cross. Uh, their their fellowship hall is uh, Colby Hall, I think it's called, or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, clearly after Maximilian Colby, they have an image of him and everything. Notice that he also, he's not some guy with the small, you know, he has 239,000 subscribers. This yeah. isn't some just random guy. This isn't, you know, the website, was it Mary is God, where it's clearly just some <laughs> random dude who's like crazy. No, this is yeah, somebody yeah. who's in communion with Rome. So yeah, he has yeah. 239,000 subscribers uh, and is following, I think I think we could probably say he's following the teachings of Maximilian Colby and Alphonsus de Liguri, among other Marians, uh, yeah. pretty well. And as he'll say, he's going to say, give us books to read too. So Yeah, he, he claims this is all like consistent with official teaching of the church, apparently. And mm -hmm. also one of the, the things that he got really popular for actually his most popular video. He did a video with Jordan Peterson's wife where really? she I gave a, that. yeah, she gave a conversion of her praying the rosary and it's on his channel and they did like a whole video together. So, wow. So yeah. with that in mind, we're going to watch a few videos of his and we are going to probably convert. Uh, we're going to consecrate ourselves. I'm sure by the <laughs> end of this. We're going to be Definitely. very, very heavily convinced. So I'm just going to switch the tab here. Let's switch it. So we're going to start off with this wonderful short. Okay, here we go. And we'll we'll try to, for the short, I don't think I'll interrupt it, really. I think we'll watch the whole thing and talk because it's short enough. So here we go. We'll make a total consecration to the Virgin Mary. But few people live this well. How can you do this practically? Do the things that you would normally do for yourself do them for Mary and with Mary to please Mary. So for example, you would normally brush your teeth for yourself, but this time you're gonna act as if you're brushing your teeth for the Virgin Mary because you've consecrated everything totally over to her. You're gonna go buy groceries for the Virgin Mary. You're cooking dinner for the Virgin Mary. You're driving your car, you're driving the Virgin Mary's car and you're driving it to the best of your ability because you're doing it for Mary. You give it to the Virgin Mary and she gives it to Jesus Christ. This is the secret to total consecration. Everything that you do, you do it with Mary and through Mary. Everything that you do becomes extraordinarily meritorious. To learn more about total consecration, check out my favorite book, The Secret of Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. Hit subscribe for more content. So, yeah, I just want to start that off by saying, like, notice 
some people could immediately respond to it. Well, much of this is not a problem because you can just say, well, you know, don't you, I don't know, I guess I, I don't have kids, but reasonably you could say, well, don't you go to work for your kids to a man who has say three children? Mm -hmm. Don't you say that you do most of your things for them? And there are people that are saying like, I live my life for my children kind of thing. But I think that's not what's going on here. I think it's much, much, much stronger than that because with the children, it's you have a vocation to protect them, to take care of them. God has given you this and it is a way by which you are worshiping God. Whereas mm -hmm. here it's very much, it's for Mary. He specifically says to please Mary to, you yeah, know, yeah. you are driving Mary's car as though Mary has ownership of this property. So yeah, there's a lot going on. Any, any thoughts there, Tony? Yeah. Uh, oh <laughs> Jeez. I mean, yeah, like it is almost like he's replacing it. St. Paul says in scripture, he's like, everything you do, do to the glory of God, do everything out of thanks to God, you know, and all things mm -hmm. give glory and thanks to God. He's say, he's taking these very like Christian principles, basic things of like everything you do, do it to the worship of God. And he's like, but do it for Mary. So when you get up, brush your teeth for Mary, it's like, yeah. what, is the, what does that even mean? Other than like, you're sort of like, like literally trying to live as if you're like a servant to her which typically would be like worship, right? Yeah. Well, what I always think about is what what is the distinction between this and worship then? Like what's the distinction between this consecration and worship? I, I just straight don't know. I don't know. Uh, one last thing to say though, St. Louis de Montfort, I think he was actually the guy who uh, came up with the consecration of Mary. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it's key also that he's, a, he's sainted. That's yeah, really yeah. Good. So, yes, um, I think I think it also, you know, notice that in this, I already mentioned how he talks as though Mary owns the car. You know, it, it's very much like she has property and then she gives that to Christ, which I think is kind of wild. Uh, yeah, according to his yeah, system. Super weird. Yeah. And on top of that, he talks about how you do this and you get it's like extremely meritorious, I think was his language. <laughs> it's yeah. like, wow, I, that's just wild to me. It's it's very much this is this is the per, point of this video for those who don't know uh, i just want to make this explicit one is just to watch this stuff and be appalled but two is to show that like a lot of the apologists when they talk about how you treat mary they'll say things like well you know you pray to mary because she's jesus's mom and like she's kind of like our mother too and and you know it's kind of like asking your friend or your friend's mom to pray for you it's like yeah i typically don't consecrate myself to my my friends and you know I don't, I didn't even consecrate myself to my mother. Like it's kind of different. <laughs> so I think yeah. this is an example of that being wild. And that will get more explicit at, with yes. the other videos we're going to react to. Like you'll see exactly what he's trying to say. Like he will say things like you need to offer your soul to Mary as a sacrifice. Yes. Like your soul belongs to Mary. Now you literally surrender your soul and your entire being to her. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it does start to like, how is this different from worship? Like, if that's not worship, what is, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of those, again, it, it, I know I bring it up so much, but like, what does he mean when he says that Mary owns this car? So, I mean, I know he, he said drive it as you are driving Mary's car. Like, is Mary given the authority over that property? Like, how and why? You know what I mean? She, uh, she has dominion over the whole earth or something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, which is only predicated of God, historically, right? Like, and, and and it's communicated to Christ according to his humanity, but frankly, it's never predicated of a of a creature that's not in actual hypostatic union with the with God Himself. Yeah, well, right? according it's, to Alphonsus de Liguori, uh, Mary was made omnipotent by grace, and uh, the reason why Satan fell from heaven was because he saw how uh, glorified Mary would become. Oh, that's right. Did. That's right. I forgot yeah. about that. How could I ever forget? Um, but again, this is, this is just a uh, tip of the iceberg and we're showing like four videos today. Uh, there are way more on this guy's channel. This is, this is yeah, not this guy, this. this guy has like big influence. I mean, he talks to like Catholic youth, like all over America, like people invite him to their church events to talk to their teenagers. Well, like he's not yeah. just some like random dude. That's like fringe, like priests and other people like invite this guy to their events. Right. Um, I remember you said that like a friend of yours 
was sending you these things when they were Catholic. Yeah. A Catholic friend of yours was sending you these things very seriously. Mm -hmm. This wasn't just, yes. we. I found this as a joke. No, you were sent this. Yeah, and yeah. You've been like, sending it to me <laughs> to make me suffer. Yeah, they, <laughs> they wanted me to see the beauty in these videos. Like there was something I was missing in my spiritual life or something. Yeah, All right. Shall we go on to the next one? Or is there anything else you want to say on this? Um. Oh, uh, one thing I'll say is that um, like these people that he mentions, like mm -hmm. Alphonsus de Liguori, like he is a sainted doctor of the church. Like yes. he's not just some random guy. <laughs> so right. I mean, even being sainted is very serious. Yeah. Like it, but to be clear, being a doctor is wild. Is... Yeah. Being a doctor yeah. is like I think there are what only like thirty three doctors or something like that. Yeah. There's not a lot. It's it's not a, just a, a a standard title. This is something like if you're a doctor, and it's like not only are they they clearly think you're in heaven because you're already sainted, but it's like way beyond that. Yeah, this is like these are like uh, foundational like teachers of like the articles of faith. Like these are your Augustines, your Aquinas's. Like these are right. those kinds of people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I'm gonna go on to the next one. Just close out of this tab. So this one, this one's really long. I'm about to share it, but this one's really long. We're only going to watch the first uh, few minutes of it, just because I think it covers uh, yeah. everything pretty well. And this one, I'll be more willing to to pause as we're watching it. So here we go. So I, I should say the title is "Mary Is Victory." Uh, <laughs> wow, that's that's something, right? Uh, that sounds like you could say that about someone else. Anyway. <laughs> So the secret to victory, because I'm tired of losing, and I think you're tired of losing too, but I can guarantee you victory after victory after victory, and that's going to happen through Mary. That's going to happen through Mary. So we have to have our Marian theology straight first. Why Mary? Why do we have to have Mary? Why should I go through Mary? Why should I give my life to Mary? Because we've been kind of scared. So just a quick thing, you know, he doesn't only say this is one path. He says, no, you have to have this. Like you've got <laughs> yeah. to have, uh, have Mary and devotion to get victory. Yeah. I also, I just have to laugh. This isn't the Christmas, but I have to laugh at the, the plant, Mary and then the red solo cup like that. There's just a lot happening in this image. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I just gotta say, it's just funny to me. Oh man. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's just funny. Um, but like, okay, I don't know where he's speaking this. Maybe he has in the, the description or something. I want to check. Has this in the description? Oh, and we'll look at the comments. So, yeah, look, Catholic students at Baylor, at Baylor yeah. University. Yeah, yeah. Like, Baylor is a big school, and yeah. they're not just going to let some random dude waltz in here. No, he's talking to the Catholic students at Baylor. Like, that's serious. Yeah. So, anyway, we'll continue. But I'm also, I'm also going to want to look at the comments in these too to show you what people think. Anyway, do you have any <laughs> thoughts on that so far? uh no no let's just keep going okay here and you can tell me to pause it whenever if you want me to pause it just tell me sure. into thinking oh we don't want to focus too much on mary because that will take away from jesus we have to be thoroughly convinced that nobody can love mary more than our lord did our lord is the second person of the holy trinity who's infinite who loves mary infinitely more than we could possibly conceive of we have no need to worry about loving our lady too much it's a joke to think that that's even possible. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, it doesn't for just, just to make the, take this more seriously, I suppose. Cause I mean, I just laugh cause it's absurd, but infinite an infinite quantity of love for something does not necessitate that you have like an absolute devotion for it. Like I can love somebody really extensively and not say I'm going to give my life for you. As he says earlier in this video. What matters is what does that love itself look like? I don't think it's a matter of the, the, to use a lack of better term, the quantity of the love as much as the quality and the the form of the love, so to speak. Yeah. Like, what does the love consist in? If that makes yeah. sense. Also, I think he's totally messing up the whole like issue that some people have with the marrying devotion stuff. Like he has the entire like relationship wrong. So he's like. Oh, don't worry about loving Mary too much because God loves her more than you ever could. That's the wrong way to look at it. The way that mm -hmm. you should look at it is, do I love Mary more than God? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because if you do, well, that would be idolatry. Well, and on that, 
on that line of thought, if he's saying that, okay, well, we, there's no way that you can love Mary more than, I mean, you know, God loves her infinitely, therefore it's fine. I mean, are we going to say that God doesn't love everyone infinitely, therefore, you know, should we love everyone infinitely just as we devote ourselves to Mary? It's just kind of a weird thing to me. Yeah, it's, it's, really I, it's a non sequitur. Yeah, like, but I, that's one of the dangers I see in his videos. He never qualifies his statements. He's like, oh, but of course you're supposed to love Jesus more than Mary. He never says that. Like, yeah. he's just like, oh, love Mary as much as possible and don't worry about it. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. well, if my devotion and my affections are more on Mary than Jesus, isn't that a problem? That, I mean. Yeah, because what they'll what they'll often say in response to that is, well, you're loving Jesus through Mary. <laughs> But, I mean, you could just apply anything to that. Because idolatry is not just bad stuff. You can have an idol that is intrinsically a good thing. Yeah. You know? Like, there's a reason that the uh, the bronze serpent was taken down. You know, the reason yeah. it was destroyed. Are you going to say that? I mean, God literally promises them, if you look at this, you will be healed. And people start worshiping it and takes it down. I mean, did they not, did they love it enough, you think? Of course, I think they loved it way too much. <laughs> and they yeah, were treating it this exactly. way where you could totally, I think you could 100% say, yeah, they are worshiping God through this. They, they, or they could say that. Yeah, I'm worshiping God through this. God gave this to us. He promised us these things, so we're going to worship him through it. Okay, but it takes it down because it's quite literally idolatrous, and that's what the text says. Yep. So, okay, I'm going to continue. Is it possible for me to love Our Lady more than St. Joseph? Inconceivable. Inconceivable. Is it possible for me to love Our Lady more than John the Beloved who took her into his home? Inconceivable. Why do we give ourselves to Mary? First and foremost, what is your role? What is the goal? Why did Jesus come? So that he could be united to you, so that he could be one with you. God loves you so much that he gives himself to you in the most holy Eucharist so the two may become one flesh. The goal of the Christian life, Christian perfection is this, union with God. Heaven is this, union with God. And so, too, when you want to become like Christ, the very first step is to say, Mary, be my mother. I just don't think any of that follows, though. <laughs> like, I, like I, I don't know how you go from, oh, yes, I want to be like Christ. Therefore, I have to think that I have to act as though Mary is my mother. I, I just don't really see that whatsoever, because at that point, I mean, wouldn't you just start applying like really weird things using that logic? Like, God, I need to move to Galilee. I need to, if I want to be like Jesus, I need to get put myself in all the natural circumstances where Jesus was. And then I'm more like him, but no one actually does this. I mean, besides some extremists, maybe, but I don't even know of any. Like, if you want to become more like Jesus, again, move to Jerusalem. And start, you know, talking about this temple. Like, just do a bunch of stuff that clearly we don't do and no one does. Yeah, it well, yeah, it's like funny because everything he's gonna say in this whole video, which, yeah, uh, if anyone wants to be, if anyone likes getting triggered, go watch this whole video. We're probably not gonna play the whole video. No, I can't. but what he will go <laughs> I can't on to say, it. what he will go on to say in this video is like, if you want to be truly holy, this is what you have to do. Like you got, you got to go through Mary. And like my immediate thought when like watching this guy, especially is like you gotta make, you gotta make Mary your mother as the first step towards perfection and as a christian it's like man the apostles really dropped the ball man yeah like when they're trying to teach people how to be holy and how to be saved they really dropped the ball you know <laughs> right one of the one of the fruits of the holy spirit is a spiritual adoption by mary like yeah i don't see yeah you know paul forgot to mention that one and you know in before a bunch of people saying oh sola scriptura is false but i mean i gotta be honest with you if you have John who says things like these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, you'd think he'd mention that you need to be consecrating yourself to Mary. Right. And you think that like we, you'd think that we would see this pretty early on too. Like if this is your, you know, I'll put it this way. I have read Ambrose's duties of the clergy where he goes pretty extensively on the nature of piety and what it's like to be a member of the clergy. I don't see anything in his work on that that says, Oh yeah, devote yourself to Mary first. And here's the thing is some people will say, oh, that's an argument from silence. But if anything, I'm just pushing it back on you to say, if this is a key to holiness, why don't I see it anywhere? Yeah, it's obviously it's obviously an accretion. It's obviously a development. There's no question about it. Yeah. Most yeah. of this stuff started coming about through developments in Mariology, through like a lot of the apparitions and stuff like that. So. Right. 
yeah, it's it's a real big stretch when I can't find anything in these early church fathers that matches this whatsoever. And what you have to do is say, oh, they, they definitely said it's just all unwritten. Like, I, I, that's a massive thing you have to prove. And Yeah, they'll basically go to places in the fathers where it's like, look, they said Mary was holy and blessed <laughs> by God. Therefore, yeah, you need yeah. to con- they believed what I'm saying, that you need to s- give your entire life to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they talk about how Mary is a great example of a woman, just a great Christian. <laughs> Therefore, you need to brush your teeth for her. She yeah. owns your car, right? Can I yeah, yeah. can I put Mary on like the what's it called? The um the certificate or whatever it is, you know, the, the ownership of the car. I can't remember what it's called. But <laughs> the entitlement, I can't remember. Because it is her car, it's not mine, right? It's no longer our life, it's Mary's life. Actually, oh, I think right. in this in this video, he has the famous quote I told you about where he says, It's oh, no yes. longer I who live, but Mary lives in me. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, yeah. something. But let's continue. See what else he has to say. Anything else before I do that, though? No, no. Let's, okay. let's keep going. Mary, I will do your will. Why? Because Jesus did your will. If God the... Yeah, I mean, this is a big sticking point. It's like in John 2, because that's what they always bring up is John 2. Does Jesus do the miracle because Mary tells him to? I don't think so. Like, I've seen... I think it was Chrysostom... Who says that? Who who says that Jesus is rebuking her? Yeah, he does. Yeah, it's like I. That's where they're largely getting this. And again, it doesn't follow that because he does her will qua humanity, we are therefore obligated to do it now. It's really weird. Yeah, there's so there's yeah there's like just very quickly two things to say. Like one, at best, like he gives an example of like if your mom tells you to do the dishes. You get up and do the dishes, but Jesus's example is actually not similar to that because he's like gives her some pushback before he does it, which doesn't mm-hmm. sound like a super obedient son, right? Like it's almost yeah. like Jesus is doing this reluctantly because he's trying to remind his mom, like, "Hey, you know, I'm not supposed to make my divinity known, so why are you asking me to do this? But I'll do it because you know." I'll do it for you, but just know, don't make a habit of this, right? Like, that's yeah. basically what he's doing there. And yeah. the another thing to point out, too, is, like, when Jesus was 12, he, like, ran away from his mom for three days. Mm-hmm. And then when she went, her and Joseph went back to find him, she's like, why did you leave without telling us? He says, woman, don't you know about my father's business? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that was Jesus really honoring his mom there. Yeah, you know. or honoring it in a way that they think that. And, that yeah, exactly. Of course, he's not like dishonoring his mom in that he's breaking the commandment, but like he's not giving this kind of honor that they're talking about. Right. I mean, because and another thing I just think about is, and you, you would know more than I would on this one, but where are we supposed to hear the will of Mary? Is it just in these apparitions or, or what? Yeah, I guess. Or in your in your heart of hearts when you pray to her. Uh, yeah, maybe so. Anyway, any other thoughts before I continue? Because that's <laughs> that one sentence was like, oh, yeah. yeah. No, let's keep going. Okay. Father found that the will of Our Lady was perfect for her son. It's perfect and it's good enough for me. So we have to remember it is God's will that you have a mother. And it's scriptural too. If we were to look at scripture with eyes that have not been tainted by fear of idolatry, <laughs> we would see the scriptures very clear from the beginning. There was a- I, I just, I, I just love that. Like, hey guys, don't worry. It's not a problem if you just <laughs> don't worry about idolatry. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me laugh every time because I, I, yeah, I've seen this one a few times. It's great. Oh, oh, it's just so funny. To me. Oh, do you have anything to comment there? Uh, I just. I wonder if he's ever read the Bible, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? All right, here we go. The man and a woman. And the woman, Eve, took the fruit that God had forbidden, and she gave it to Adam. And then God said to the serpent who deceived her, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And this is very important. Between your offspring and hers. Our lady has offspring. This has been proclaimed from the beginning. If we look yeah, at Jesus, like I... look at the most important times in the life of Jesus Christ. Anytime our lady is present, it's always at the most important moments in the life of Jesus Christ. Of course, at the Annunciation. 
I just got to say that doesn't prove anything, though. Where like, was she at the Ascension? Where was she at the Mount of Transfiguration? Where was he at his baptism? Yeah. You know, exactly. Like, and and even if she were there, that proves nothing. Because all it, like, are you going to say it was important because of Mary? If anything, that just says, oh, yeah, go follow Christ. She's a good example. Yeah. That's all you can say. But again, you even showed it's false. Like, we're not, I'm not, yeah, the point of this video isn't trying to bash Mary. Like, she's no. obviously a glorious woman. She should be honored. She's blessed by God, of course. It's just like when they take, they like over exaggerate this stuff. It's like, oh, she was at all of his important moments of life. It's like, okay, well, now we have to. The issue that I see when I talk to Catholics about this is when I give them some pushback. They're like, oh, you just, you're a defamer of Mary. And I'm like, I'm not trying to defame Mary. I'm trying to honor her by not you spreading lies about her. How about that? Yeah. Well, it kind of makes me think of when we talk to, I've seen this like with a pop level reform Baptists where if you start objecting, like, hey, scripture seems to go against like these specific ideas you have and their immediate response is, who are you, oh man, to question God? <laughs> like, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, you're right, though. We're not here to defame Mary by any means. It's like Mary is one of, in my mind, one of the best examples of, of faith that we could have. Uh, and humility. She, She's yes. super humble. Like, she doesn't, like, nowhere do you read about Mary's character that she would want any of this stuff being spread about her. Like, she's the right. only means to, like, she's the only means to holiness and stuff. Like, honestly, if Mary was, here, like, actually here hearing this stuff, she would probably be, like, absolutely shocked yeah that's that's my mentality too I, I just simply don't see reading just reading like the early account that we have in luke and she's just very humble and what's so funny is they'll bring out these passages about like oh look mary's called full of grace it's like or what what is it um is it full of grace or yeah or what yeah where it's like that they they almost say like because of that you know, you have to venerate her like, oh, look, she's super special. It's like, yeah, she's special. She's great. Like, are you going to say that grace is not from God, though? Like, You know, yeah. it's kind of weird to me. The same and, the same Greek for that verse, by the way, is said in uh, Ephesians 1 about the predestined in Christ. So. Yeah. Well, and it makes me think of one of the big themes in Scripture is how the low are brought, in, are brought up high. Like, Mary did not have this wild series of merits prior you know, that, yeah. that like qualify her for these things. God yeah. in his grace is the one who gives her humility such that he, she receives Christ. Mm -hmm. And she, again, she is a great example. And that's how it is for all of us. Like, I'm not saying Mary is lower than us, but it's that every single person, including Mary, has to receive grace for any real spiritual development to occur. Yeah. That Mary is just a great example of someone humbly accepting the mission that God granted that I'm not sure that many people would accept. I'd have a hard time with it. Like, yeah, of course. So, anyway. Of course, at the wedding feast of Cana, the wedding feast of Cana is miles deep, even though it's only a few short verses, miles deep. And then at the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross, we have Adam and Eve all over again at the tree. The first Eve at the tree of knowledge of good and evil took the fruit down from the tree. Oh, sing it. And we're back we're with Mark's sadness. And the team is looking down the barrel of a 455 meeting. She brought death into the world. Now Mary, the new Eve, the woman, is at the tree of life. And she's putting the fruit of her womb back onto the tree. Speaking of the wedding feast of Cana, a lot of... I, what? I mean, okay, maybe... <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just kind of don't follow that, really. Yeah, I don't know if she was, quote-unquote, putting him up there. It seemed like she was pretty distraught and want, yeah. didn't want him to be on the cross, but <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, it's just kind of weird. <laughs> Are you saying that she's the one that called for his death? <laughs> like... <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. So, yeah, so if you watch The Passion of the Christ, that movie, yeah. Um, it actually, like, it depicts, it, maybe this is inaccurate, but it actually depicts Mary of, like, wanting Jesus to not do it. Right. Like, he's getting beaten, he's carrying the cross, and then she runs over to him to, like, take him away from the crowd, and then he stands up, he's like, behold, I make all things new, and he keeps going. 
So, like, it doesn't seem like she, in the movie depiction, which I think might be accurate to the data of the Bible, maybe. I don't know. This is just conjecture. But, um, like, that's not really the depiction in most media where Mary's, like, triumphantly placing your son on the cross to die. You know? <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's very weird. If any, I mean, we don't have language of her being distraught, but we have nothing from the Gospels that indicates, oh, hey, she's the one, she's, like, intimately involved in this besides just literally being there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really weird. Yeah, I, I just don't get where he's going, but here we go. The times people think that Jesus is being rude or ugly because he calls his mother woman. That is a reference to the garden where Adam called the old Eve woman. And now Jesus, the new Adam, is calling Mary the new Eve woman. And instead of tempting Jesus to do a sin like Eve did to Adam, Our Lady is tempting Jesus to do the first miracle. Just as It's just amazing to me what they do with a generic word. Yeah, it's... Like woman... Jesus calls so many people that Greek word in the New Testament. Like every time I see people like Catholic apologists like Scott Hahn and all these other guys who are like, he calls her woman, which is, is a term of honor. He's calling her the queen and the new Eve. Like they will literally say this stuff. And it's like, well, she, Jesus literally uses the same Greek word to talk to the Gentile woman when he calls her a dog. <laughs> I didn't he know says, that. He says woman. Don't you know that the uh, the food is not for the dogs? <laughs> same Greek same Greek word. Yeah, it's just strange. I I it's a massive stretch then I mean I it just I think it reads pretty naturally to say, Oh yeah, he, he's basically saying in some way, like yes, he is her son, but he has authority over her because he is God. You know, like, I think that's kind of the point of it is like, you don't have a right to push back me, but I will do these things mm -hmm. out of love, effectively. So, okay. Any other thoughts there? No. As the old Eve believed a demon, a bad angel, the new Eve believes the good angel and brings grace and life. At the foot of the cross, Jesus, the last thing he does, he says, woman. Oh, wow. I got louder. This is very important words. You better listen. They got louder. He said, woman, behold your son. And to the disciple whom he loved, very important, was John bragging. Throughout all of history, everybody will know Jesus loved me the most. Sorry, Peter, you're the first, but I'm the one whom Jesus loved. Everybody will know for the next 2,000 years of Christianity. That's not why he did it. He was trying to give a pattern of discipleship. The disciple whom Jesus loves is the one to whom he says, behold your mother. And from that day forward, John took her into his home as his very own mother. And the words immediately after say, and Jesus knowing that all things had been completed. That was it. The purpose. So that uh, means the, that means the Pope wasn't given Mary. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's kind of weird. Uh, that would be really weird. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't. <laughs> just, just, yeah. No, but but it is funny. But like, I I guess I don't really see what he's doing here. Be well, I know what he's doing, but it's just a non sequitur. I think what he's trying to say is basically, well, you know, John's the one whom Christ loved, and he gets Mary. So the one whom who is loved by Jesus gets Mary too. I, I just. But in order in order to get loved by Jesus, you have to give your life to Mary first. Yeah, it's really weird I, I just so don't... somewhere somewhere in this picture john gave his life to mary <laughs> yeah. before that yeah. happened oh yeah definitely that's somewhere in there um yeah it's definitely there should we watch any more <laughs> do you think that that covers it uh yeah we can we can stop there if you want that's okay fine. but let's look at some of these comments all right let's look at these comments you know um <clears throat> Let's see how long this one is. I'll, I'll just read the first. Yeah, this, this is someone that says they were there in person. Hearing hearing the speech on the rosary had an impact on my life I will never forget. And then also in here. Let's see. Yeah, it's like. All of this was inspiring in light of the ability that, that 
you know, sister hadn't been able to bear children. So this really touched this person. Um, yeah, excellent talk. Our baby boy passed away three months ago. That that just straight sucks. Not trying to make light of that. But while listening to this talk, our mother gave me a consolation. She gave me an image of my son, which is just like, uh, it's just like wild to me. I, you know, this is, this is the kind of stuff where, again, they talk about it's like, oh yeah, you're not, you know, you're not doing anything idolatrous. You're just talking to your friend, asking them to pray for you. Like this doesn't seem like that. No, it's definitely not. It's really not. I mean, this is like an entire way of life for people. Like, mm -hmm. like they devote their entire lives to this stuff. Yeah, I, I also love this one. Demon said during an exorcism, if Christians knew the power of the Holy Rosary, it will be my end. I do trust <laughs> demons immensely. We always should get our theology from demons. Yeah, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great sign right there. It's just like, like my point in showing this is not, oh, look at these specific comments. So all of these are like, oh, thank you so much. And like, just look at all these. You know, look at all this stuff. Yeah. There's so much here. Like, this is not something small. There are a lot of people trying to live this out. Oh, yeah. Okay. On to the next one. This one will switch it over. I'm trying to see. Someone's going to be able to correct me, I swear. They're like, oh, you could switch over, switch over much faster, but... Eh, whatever. This one will watch the whole thing because this is how he tells us how to consecrate ourselves. Mm, yeah, yeah, this one's good. You know, this one tells us how to consecrate. All right, here we go. I just want to say the production quality on these videos are good. Sorry, say that again. I just want to say the production quality on his videos are somehow really good. They are really good. I, I am impressed by them. They're genuinely Genuine quite money. good. So I wish we had this production quality. Maybe if we consecrate ourselves to Mary, we'll get it. That's, you know what? That might be a secret. It might just be. All right. One of the most transformative things that you could ever do, total consecration. Any person who's ever done total consecration and done it with a good intention and taken it very seriously, they will say, my Marian consecration was the turning point of my life. I, I think that's really wild compared to everything else that happens in our lives as Christians. Like, the Marian consecration, not your baptism, not your confirmation and first Eucharist. No, well, it's he your says Marian. The Marian. He says the Marian consecration is like a second baptism, I think, in this video. So. Oh, well, he's going against Aquinas, who says the second baptism is uh, entering a monastery. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's continue. St. John Paul II said his Marian consecration was the turning point of his life. St. Louis de Montfort, turning point of his life. Mother Teresa, all of the greatest saints, their Marian consecration was like a second baptism for them. It was like a real... <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Oh, yeah, second baptism, huh? That's just like... Because what they're saying is this is meritorious, right? Like, as for them, it's meritorious. It, it removes your previous sins to consecrate yourself to Mary. So you you oh it's, you've been baptized in the Christ yeah that's okay but have you been baptized in the Mary now that's yeah. even better. I also like how he says all the greatest saints and all of them are in the past twenty in the twentieth century. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just love that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Mother I just Teresa, like Mother Teresa who uh, said that um, um, that uh, we shouldn't try to convert Mundi Muslims and Hindus. Um, and I, when she goes up to Muslims and Hindus, she encourages them to be the best Muslim and Hindus they can be. Like that's that's one of the greatest things. Yeah. Well, I just I just like to imagine this guy going back in time. Like, what does he think he's gonna see in like the second century happening? Like, what does he think second century? <laughs> he's probably gonna he's probably gonna think they're all doomed because they're not consecrating themselves to Mary. Yeah. It's weird. Anyway, let's continue. Mule in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to teach you the easiest way to do your Marian consecration, and I'm going to do it with you. I promise it will impact every facet of your Jeez, life. These people... Peace will flood into your soul. Sorry. I was just saying those girls were just like absolute, like the Pope was like a rock star. They were like yeah, gushing at him. I know. saw it, yeah. Anyway. And you will say the day I did my Marian consecration was a turning point for me. Maybe I didn't feel anything on that day, but on that day, something inside of me changed. 
and I began to go from victory to victory. So the total consecration that I want to encourage you to do is inspired by the theology of Maximilian Kolbe. Why Maximilian Kolbe? Because St. John Paul II said he is the prophet of the new millennium. Again, with that in mind, this is not small. Yeah. Like John Paul II. Did you say John Paul or John Paul II? John Paul II, yeah. Okay. So John Paul II says this. I mean, that's very serious. A pope at the time was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And John Paul II is sainted as well. He's Saint right. John Paul. And he's like, he's the pope that every Catholic loves, as far as I know. Yeah, lots of lots of Catholics like him. Like obviously, and not not, super, not sorry? trads, but not trads. Well, yeah, not the not the sades, not the sade of Acantists. I don't know about the SSPX, but when we're talking just about like your standard Catholic that is in yeah. communion with Rome, I mean, he's the guy you see everywhere. When I lived oh, in yeah. San Diego, the small the small Catholic church uh, yeah. that was near me, they had you know the picture of John Paul II up. When I, in Minneapolis, I think they have a, a photo of him at both the Catholic parishes I've seen or I've been to. So, yeah, you know, he's very well liked. Definitely. Anyway. His theology and his insights into the union of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary is going to transform the church. We will begin the preparation for total consecration on January 9th. And it will end on February. I'm sorry. I, for a second, I thought I said January 6th, and that would have been really funny. <laughs> that would have been hilarious. <laughs> sorry. Okay. The 11th, the Feast of Our Lady of Lords. Why that? Because Maximilian Colby had an obsession with Our Lady of Lords when she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. That phrase stood out in his mind above all other phrases. He asked the question to him. This is just a genuine question. Like, when does she say that? Does she just say that in like a vision to him? Or where is that coming from? Um, I think she says it in Fatima, I think. Um, ooh, I'm going to look that up. I actually want to know this because I think that's an interesting question. I think she appears to them and says, I am the Immaculate Conception, like offer, soul, uh, offer sacrifices for sinners and stuff. Uh, I think, no, I think it was, it, it was Our Lady of Lourdes, not Fatima. Oh, okay. But it, but it was a Marian apparition is the point on the last. Oh, okay, okay, I gotcha. So this isn't, for the record, this isn't from some theologian, this is just from, you know, an apparition. Yeah. And there, there was a commenter who, want, like, on one of our videos who wanted me to engage with, uh, some more of the Roman Catholic apparitions uh, and all that stuff. And I'd like to at some point, but suffice it to say that I just, I never found it compelling as the source of stuff because again, like a lot of people, I mean, Galatians 1.8 is just obvious. Like it just says, you know, even if an angel of light comes for it with a new gospel, whatever. Um, and a lot of the Marian apparitions basically say, hey, take on the sins of those around you, right? And punish yourselves for them, which is, doing what Christ already did. And I know they're going to say, oh, this is orthodox within our theology. But that's the point. That's the problem. Um, but then on top of that, I just like what they'll so often say is, well, Mary says like, hey, pray and do all this good stuff. It's like, well, yeah, but wicked people can use, well, let's say a lot of good things, but they, they can mix that in with some error. Yeah, like Our Lady of Guadalupe, for example, she comes to the person and says, build this temple in my honor. Yeah. And it's like, well, I mean, that doesn't sound very Christian. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's something else. Okay. So, who are you, O Immaculate Conception? What does that mean? And he discovered Our Lady is so united to the Holy Spirit that where the Holy Spirit finds Mary in his soul, he flies there. We are. So, Mary is in the soul, and he is, or sorry, and she is prior, she's in the soul prior to the Holy Spirit. Does that sound right? Is that a good, do you think that's an accurate summary of what he's saying here? <laughs> uh, at least, I guess if we're going to be charitable, maybe he thinks the fullness of the spirit doesn't come unless Mary's in there first, I guess. That's I fair, that's fair. Yeah. But yeah, I, it's, it's, it's really weird. We'll be charitable and hyper-nuanced and qualified and say yeah. that, uh, <laughs> we'll say that, <laughs> yeah, it's the fullness of the Holy Spirit is there when Mary is there. But that's just again it's something else i mean how do you where do you get this stuff where do you see this in the early church like where is this said it's not exactly exactly it's just out of nowhere so 
are in deep need of renewal, not just in the church, but in our families, in our own personal lives. And Jesus promised that that renewal would happen with in and through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit flies to the soul that is Marian. And so you need this, try this. I give you my word, one of the fruits of your consecration will be peace of soul. And you will notice that the Holy Spirit stirs up in your life. You'll have a greater hunger and thirst for righteousness. So I'm going to make this super easy. The booklet that we're going to use is inspired by Maximilian Colby, but specifically it's short. So many people try to do their 33 days of preparation and they fail because it's a lot of prayers and a lot of readings and they fall behind. The readings that we're going to do only take a few short minutes, four to five minutes per day. The booklet is extremely cheap. And in addition to that, I'm going to have a live stream every single day for 33 days at 8 p.m. every single day starting January 9th up until February the 10th. And I will do the readings with you and for you if necessary. Some of you are in countries that might not be able to get this booklet. Some of you might be behind and you want to just listen to it in your car. You want to do your best, but sometimes your best is terrible and it's better to do something poorly than not do it at all. Our lady will take anything that she can get. She's hungry to be your- Again, it's just funny that it's like she's the one receiving this. You know, it's very much this language that you that we direct at God of, God will take what we can get. Now, that obviously, I'm not saying that we're justified by by some kind of merit that, you know, God infuses, so to speak. Like God, God takes what our merit is, says, "All right, I know it's not good, but I'll value it higher." It's very much yeah. applied to Mary in this case. It's very yeah. much the language of what the Catholics say about God. Mm -hmm. So, any other thoughts? I mean, this a lot of this is just event planning so to speak i'll have more thoughts as he goes on because he's okay. about to say some wild stuff okay <laughs> your mother to nourish you to console you and to love you so it's very important in the description section in the comment section i'm gonna put the links for what for the book you should buy the book i'm gonna put the links to what to my other youtube channel because i'm not gonna flood this youtube channel with daily short posts concerning the readings that we could all read on our own, but some people like to do things in a group. So that's gonna be on my separate channel. The links for the books will be there. If you can't afford the book or you can't get the book for any reason, you can just listen to it. I wanna encourage you, get your family members to do this. Invite them to do this. If you have a husband or if you have a wife or if you have a child that's living at home and they're not in the faith, offer them the booklet say hey will you do this with me and even if they say no this is the beautiful thing about our lady even if they say no you're doing it they're your family member when you give your life to the virgin mary she gives her life back to you <laughs> your husband <laughs> oh wow what does that mean though like what does it mean when you give your life to her what does it mean she gives it back to you i guess i guess she um gives it give you yourself back but you're better i guess i don't really know yeah let's see if he clarifies husband is a member of your family you give her your life guess what she's also now responsible for him and all of mary's family members go to heaven when you surrender <laughs> your life to the virgin mary graces will flow into you wait so wait so I'm, I'm trying to figure this out so if she's responsible for him that sounds like he is saying that she that you know he is in her family and if all members of her family go to heaven uh I, that's kind of so what he's saying is if if let's say you have family members right and yeah. you give your life to mary uh -huh. <clears throat> your family members now become mary's family members uh-huh and all of mary's family goes to heaven this is mary in... make sure mary make sure that everyone in her family goes to heaven is this like a I, let's be hyper nuanced and and charitable and qualified? You know, we're we're not trying to be schismatic. Um, right. May, you know, at the best possible construction, what we could say is that whoever gives the rest of their family over, they'll convert eventually. But he doesn't say that. No, he doesn't. He doesn't it just it seems. Mary will overcome their resistance. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean that's kind of what it sounds like. Anyway, apparently, uh, apparently it's not good enough to do like Mary can overcome the resistance, but God can't. So, oh, yeah, yeah.
irresistible grace is i'm i'm a and <laughs> i believe grace, in irresistible grace just by mary <laughs> yeah but not, not by god your family and even the problem troublemaker in the family if it's not ourselves they will be converted slowly okay. but surely our lady okay will okay there's the clarity that they will be converted that's see but this is this is the catch-22 on this right because this is what gabby will do to defend his crazy teachings yeah is that if someone comes to him it's like but they didn't convert and it's like oh well you just weren't sincere enough when you get your life oh married. yeah so yeah well that's that's kind of the language of of a lot of the stuff i mean that's how they can qualify a ton of things so, like, they'll talk about how, for example, if you want to confess your sins and the priest isn't any, you can have perfect contrition. Like, oh yeah, my contrition is totally perfect. Like, oh well, you can't know that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't know that, and it's there's not like a. I guess what I wonder is what is the in in all of these cases, and this applies, you know, to the way evangelicals or cares specifically words of faith people apply this. How do you like measure? How do you know if it's good enough? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, what do you do when somebody has like you know, some mental issues, like mental health issues specifically, where they're not able to feel that sincere. Like what comfort is there for them? Yeah. I guess you just have to see if your family members convert and if they don't, that means you did it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if you did it wrong, you're not becoming holy enough, which is really important. Yeah, that too. Will soften their hearts and grace will flow. Let me give you the important details one more time. We're going to start preparing on January 9th. Order your book right now. We will finish preparing on February the 10th. I think that's pretty February much it for 11th. This video, though. The yeah, I think it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, he just kind of goes on to recap. But yeah, I just wanted wanted the listeners to hear the stuff he's saying. Like he's like, if you, it's almost like it's almost like if like, because uh, I I don't know. I've watched like a lot of um, uh, kinds of like horror movies or other mm -hmm. genres where like a devil will show up to somebody and they'll be like if you give me your soul i'll make sure this happens for you right <laughs> and uh that's almost what he's saying he's like if you give mary your soul she'll make sure this happens <laughs> <laughs> it's like what in the heck this is like some weird bargain thing it's like if you sell your soul to mary your family members will be saved yeah it almost sounds like some weird like trick well know? and what's what what I wonder is, what do you say about like the apostles and others who even talk about, you know, <laughs> it makes me think of First Corinthians seven, where there's this talk about what do you do if you're married to an unbeliever, and the language is basically, yeah, your kids are going to be sanctified, you know, through the believer, and you'll be sanctifying life. It's not, yeah, pray to Mary and she'll second. do it. Sorry. Sorry, Didn't, that was my brother. He knocked was, on my brother. That wasn't Mary telling you to stop making this video? Uh maybe that was maybe that was a message. Yeah. Maybe that's she sent my brother to stop me, you yeah. know. Well, it, so what one of the things I've been thinking about recently, and I, I might make another video on this, it's is that there's kind of this thing in like charismatic circles, and I kind of am starting to see it here where it's you know, you treat God, or in this case Mary, as like kind of this genie where if you say the right prayers you do the right things then they'll be disposed to do this stuff like you kind of have to conjure them in a way and i'm not i'm not trying to say i'm like a other oh, satanists or like they're straight pagans i'm not going to go that far but it just it's just kind of strange to me and i think it doesn't fit with the rest of the stuff they're saying no definitely not it is like weird like bargaining things like it's almost like it's almost like you give Mary this, this is what you get in return. It's like, it is almost kind of treating it like a genie thing. Like the mm -hmm. brown scap, like the, all the different scapulars. It's like, oh, if you do this, Mary will take you out of purgatory and all this other stuff. And that's why there's talk in Catholic circles about the scapulars being fi called fire insurance. It's like, oh, well, a, a person who dies with a scapular mary will drag them by the neck if they're gonna go to hell and drag them to heaven huh and it's yeah, like this is before. just like some weird stuff man well this is you know people talk about talk a lot of time about how right talk a lot about how 
you know, Luther, oh, maybe he was exaggerating. Like, nah, we, we see it today, too. And if you read, like, some of the medievals, some of the stuff they're saying is wild on this. Like, there's very much, you know, Melanchthon talks about this in the in the volume that I'm trying to get through. Um, or actually, no, I, I got through it. So Melanchthon in his work on justification through faith um, or something like that, is it of justification by faith alone for men only or something like that? Um, it's somewhere along that line. He talks about how the philosophers, the medievals, they basically invent these works for themselves. So they're trying to find something they can do to add that. Oh, like, look, if you do these extra prayers, it's more meritorious instead of yeah. we'll take what scripture <clears throat> says about having faith and be faithful, basically. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so, all right. On to the final video. Our final video. Okay. Pull it up. And then after the video, let's uh, let's read that thing you were talking about. Okay. Okay, so this one, again, this one's going to show it. It's not small. Five Marian, five must-read Marian books. I'm going to skip past the, well, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll keep the I'm going to share with you the five must-read Marian books. They're going to help you take your relationship with the Virgin Mary to the next level. Your spiritual life will not be the same. In addition to these five must read books, I'm gonna give you four bonus books that you can read after those five. In addition to those four- I just have to notice that like literally every single piece of art is Mary. Mary, yeah. Mary, 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 Mary. Is this Mary too? Yeah. And then I don't know if that's Mary or not. Yeah, he's wearing like a medal and he also wears like a scapular as well. Mm, what even like, I'm gonna sound so ignorant here. What even is a scapular? So it's like this thing you wear under your clothing. It's kind of like a, like a leather like square mm. and it has like a symbol on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Anyway. For bonus books, I'm going to give you two books recommended for Protestants Ooh. or for Catholics Ooh. who have absolutely no idea why we're praying to Mary. So let's get started. So the first two books that I have for you are for Protestants or for Catholics who want a scriptural understanding of why we have Marian devotion. The first book I recommend is called Hail Holy Queen by Scott Hahn. This was the first Marian book that I read, and it really opened my eyes to a lot of the biblical teaching about Mary. The second book that I have to recommend for Protestants or for Catholics who are just completely unaware of Marian devotion, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. And this is written by Dr. Brant Petrie. Hail Holy Queen, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. All right, now let's get to the- I should say just a quick story that's funny about Scott Hahn. That, uh, so apparently I, I heard this secondhand, like, I guess it'd be third hand because I heard it from someone who told me this, that they heard it well, in an interview with him was that, you know, he was what Presbyterian before and he had jumped to, to Rome and somebody asked him like, you know, why didn't you consider Lutheranism? A lot of the things that you like are things that Lutherans have. And he's just like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> He's just like, oh, I'd never even thought of it really. He just didn't enter my mind. I just think it's kind of funny. That's not a criticism. It's just like, that's part of yeah. why we have this channel is, we need to kind of spread it. Yeah, the main reason Scott Hahn became Catholic was because of the Eucharist. Like, that's the reason he gives. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so Scott Hahn's book is pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> so there, there is a good video. Actually, I've never recommended this, but Mike Winger, okay, popular guy, he actually has a good video response to that book. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, Scott Hahn will say things you cannot have Jesus as your king if you don't have Mary as your queen and stuff like that. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is a this is an exclusive Tony moment where we're we're unironically recommending Mike Winger. Uh, yeah, no, but you know we got to give credit where credit is yeah. due, I guess. But at least on that topic, he's pretty solid. Like, yeah. Um, I should it, also say I, I hear good things about Brant Petrie. Mm. I hear good things I'm, about him in general. I'm actually not familiar with that other work but i i am familiar with scott hahn's book yeah yeah i'd be i'd be curious to see that uh maybe someday we look into these books see what they have to say what i find a lot of these works do is pretty much what gabby after hours has been doing the whole time where it's like hey here's a passage of scripture that says mary did something cool okay you got to consecrate yourself yeah yeah scott hahn does like all these parallels between like typologies well quote-unquote typologies where it's like oh well 
marries the Ark of the Covenant because when the Ark was brought to David, he says, who am I that the, you know, the Lord should come to me? And that's what Elizabeth said to Mary. Therefore, Mary's the Ark of the Covenant and she's holy and all this stuff. Hmm. Yeah, typology is kind of their big thing. Like that's where they prove a lot of this stuff, which again is... But yeah, if you want to see a good response to all of his weird arguments in that book, Mike Winger, he has a whole like hour long video where he responds to that stuff. So, okay, I'd be curious to see that at some point. But all right, let's actually get to his his books for Catholics. Those five must reads. These are my personal recommendations. I'm going to give you these five in the order that I think that you should read them. I'm going to give you a quick description of the book and why it is so powerful. So let's start off with number one. Are you ready? Number one, The Secret of Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. Many people have heard of True Devotion to the Virgin Mary. Great book. But look, this book is significantly thinner. It's only 52 pages, the font is big, and the spacing is generous. So St. Louis de Montfort condenses purifies, intensifies the teaching of true devotion in a short, easy to read, concise book. This is spiritual gold. This is a must, 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 must read. Although it is only 52 pages, this is not the kind of book that you read just once. You need to read this, you need to pray with it, you need to interiorize it, you need to ponder it. If you want to know the secret of the saints, the fastest, most secure, sweetest path to Jesus Christ, The Secret of Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. It's always so funny to me. Again, this is what I was talking about before with the charismatics is how there's this language of like, oh, here are these secret ways to get to Jesus. You know, it's like <laughs> it's just the top five tricks to, to believe in Jesus. It's like, uh, read the bible like i mean like if we're being serious it's just like read the bible and partake of the sacraments like this isn't something secret dude is it there yeah, you don't have no, to do these all tricks you have to buy a bunch of crazy stuff yeah it's like if you really want to know how to be christian buy this book right it's like i it's just crazy what these people are doing i mean it sounds so gnostic like there's these secret traditions that exist that you have to find out how the real what it means to be a real christian yeah <laughs> And it's like obviously they're they're not full on Gnostic. We're not calling these people Gnostics. They're not no. saying that like you know the aeons emanated from God. Like no, but but it's very much the same attitude of oh you know there's these people that are they're pretty good Christians. They're fine, but like if you really want to get through the backtrack, like the secret way, the way that you can be really special to God, here are the books you got to follow. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And it's and it's not just stuff like hey you know our our this is the best stuff that explains what's in scripture or something like that. No, this is additional material that's coming from like apparitions and things like that as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So anyway. Book number 2. The Secret of the Rosary by St. Louis de Montfort. St. Louis de Montfort, he loves secrets. This is gold in a book form. <laughs> Many times yeah. people talk. <laughs> I, I know seek like for us, you know, Kurt Marquardt has a great statement that a secret is not like in the church is a secret is not. Oh no, a mystery. Sorry. He talks about how a mystery is not something or, and I think in this case you could generally say a secret is not something that God like hides. It's not like hidden that you're searching for, but you're really like, it's something pronounced, but it's secret to us because we don't fully understand it or it's mysterious us. We don't understand it. I think that's what he's going for here. Yeah. Hopefully. But it's still funny. It's just fully in line with what we were saying before, though. It's just funny. Talk about the rosary, and they have no foundation in what the rosary's origins were, what the intention of the rosary is, and secrets to praying the rosary well. In this book, you will discover that the rosary isn't just 50 Hail Marys or five decades. It is meant to be a prayer that spans the entire day and to cover the entire life of Jesus Christ. Once you read this book, once you interiorize this book, living a life of true devotion to Mary, living a life of holy slavery or of total consecration oh, wait, becomes oh. easy. So, <laughs> oh, okay. So you become a slave to Mary. Yeah. That's what his def I mean, it seems as though he was using slave and consecration there to be like a consecrated entity and then a slave seems to be uh, convertible to him. Like he talked about it. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, yeah, it so. just sounds. It just seems to me like what 
the Bible seems to suggest like when you become a slave to something, you're giving it authority over your life, you know? I mean, yeah, that's what he does here to Mary. And when and he for him, he thinks you're supposed to give total slavery to Mary, which means like you obey her in everything. But for me, it's like that's just I, to give the same level of obedience to God. It is. And I just don't understand how that's not worship. You know, again, that's what we always talk about is they'll 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 say, oh, well, it's because you Protestants, you know, worship includes sacrifice. And we don't sacrifice things. You wouldn't understand because you don't have true sacrifice. It's like, well, it seems to me that you're sacrificing a lot. If you're following every single thing Mary's saying, unless you're going to be really, really specific. It's like, oh, we're not offering the Eucharist to her. Or something like that yeah that's what they that's literally what they will say when like when i'm like how's this not worship they're like oh well we it's not worship because we don't offer the mass to mary and it's like wait i'm like you do realize like that's not the only thing that's considered worship right I'm yeah like, what do you do with the entire old testament yeah it's like well isn't it offering praise and thanks said to be like offerings of sacrifices of worship to god like look at hebrews look at revelation <laughs> like yeah isn't it, you know, let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice? Yeah, exactly. It, or like when John bows to the angel, the angel says, hey, don't worship me, worship God. He wasn't yeah, offering and, the and for that, prayer, right? you know? Peter. Yeah, exactly. It's just crazy. It's just obviously false. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, this is the theory. This is the idea I am trying to capture, the secret of Mary. And... This is how I do it in my prayer life, practically. By praying the rosary, I hear the voice of the Virgin Mary more clearly. I become a devout servant of Jesus Christ, and I have the help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and my sufferings. The third book that is an absolute must, must, must read is The Glories of Mary, by St. Alphonsus Liguori. St. Alphonsus is a doctor of the church, and that's very important. He's the doctor of moral theology. What that means is, when it comes to teachings of morality, and hence salvation, St. Alphonsus is a sure guide. We can trust him. And what I love most about St. Alphonsus, not just that he's a doctor of the church, but whenever he makes a point, he backs up his point with, other church doctors. He'll quote St. Augustine, St. Bernard, St. Thomas Aquinas, and he just layers it and layers it and layers it on. And he'll say, just as Thomas says, and Salam agrees, and he'll just, he will just make his case definitive. And he says what would sound to be to the average ear, crazy things. I'll give you one quick example. He will say, Mary is omnipotent, not by nature. God is omnipotent by nature, but Mary is omnipotent by grace. Mary is all powerful as a gift from God. Mary has not only the title of queen of heaven and earth, but she's also the queen over the heart of God. And the average person. Yeah, I wanted to make it through the whole thing, but I, I just can't do that to myself. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to watch it. I just mean without saying something. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. Again, I don't know how anybody could not just apply this to quite literally any idol they have. Like, how yeah, do you could. not go, you know, Moses comes down and he goes, and like, well, what are you doing with this golden calf? And he's like, ah, he's omnipotent by grace. God gave him this. Well, you know, the, the calf is God's treasured artifact that he will bless anyone who uh, serves it. Yeah. And by serving it, we bless God and worship. <laughs> I have to consecrate myself to the golden calf now. Yeah, exactly. It's like ridiculous. But like, yeah, like in that book, it's like you'll see things like Mary is the neck that turns the head of God to favor the sinner. Like and that Mary, whatever Mary says, Jesus has to obey because he has to obey his mom because, you know, he's a good Jewish boy. So he'll do it whatever his mom says. Well, what makes it funny to me or I won't say funny, but this really clicked my head is you have all of this language this is really what led to a lot of the reformation because what they're doing is they're basically saying yeah god is terrifying the language a lot of the time of christ a lot of the images of christ in the medieval era were christ as judge but hey, hey here's mary she's really nice go to her so she appeases god and in doing so you are kind of 
being a you are you are definitely performing idolatry because what's going on is you are trusting Mary to convince God of these things. You in a way you were trusting Mary the most. It's idolatry because you have their they have their own fantasized imaginary vision of who they think Mary is. And Christ and, for that matter. And yeah, and Christ, they, they just put this imaginary depiction of Mary in the place of what the Bible says Jesus does. Right. So it's like, well, we need Mary because she commands the heart of God. And it's like, well, isn't it Jesus said to do that? Oh, well, you need Mary for Jesus's heart. And it's like, well, it doesn't just, just create an infinite regress. Oh, well, it stops at Mary because we said so. Well, and even not that, but it takes away the whole comfort. Like all of the language of Paul on this, or and and the author of Hebrews, whoever it, if you want to say, but all of it of Christ as our mediator is like we can go to the the throne of grace boldly. Yeah, go boldly, and there's very much this confidence of Christ is there for you. But in this case, it's like, hey, it's really not. You got to convince Mary to do it, and then she'll do it. Like what? There's no comfort there. What's the whole point of even mentioning it? Because if both if both Christ qua humanity and God or you know qua divine nature are opposed to you, what's the whole point of getting comfort in the mediator? Yeah, exactly. It's or like Jesus, if we have if we ever sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. Or it says, Well, when we're tempted, we know that we have a merciful savior who is tempted like we are and understands our sufferings and our temptations and our weakness. Mm -hmm. Like all these things are said about Jesus or when Jesus says all who are burdened and heavy laden come to me and I will give you rest. Like he seems very comforting and inviting to everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. He says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. I mean, how more inviting could you get? <laughs> well, actually, you know, obviously belief there is just a kind of metonymy that's speaking of belief and works <laughs> like like that yeah. definitely doesn't like, that definitely doesn't mean that it practically means nothing and that all you have to do is believe. Yeah, that's true. It's actually not something that we're able to draw any comfort from. We're actually supposed to draw fear from it. Right. Because wasn't, I think there were some medieval theologians who said, yeah, the new law is harder to follow. <laughs> like it's, we're worse off at this point, basically. Yeah. Like it obviously is. I mean, like if you're viewing it in that way, right? Like if you're viewing it in terms of like, that's why they had to come up with the whole evangelical councils, right? Right. Where they're like, oh, well, some of these aren't real. Like, it's not necessary to not lust because that that's just too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Which is because what they have to recognize, you have to fall back to our point. Like if you just and this is what Wesley does with with Christian perfection is he's going to deny certain things as sins, like specifically concupiscence. Where it's like, yeah, you can be perfect. Whereas we as Lutherans are very pessimistic in terms of the fact that and the, and the reformed are too in the fact that while these are things that we simply are commanded to do and we can't fulfill augustine is like this in on the spirit and the letter um that by the grace of god we do love the law we do love the law and as i think that's one of the biggest signs of christian maturity is that you do love and understand it. you don't just follow because god purely says so as though it's just arbitrary and god no. walks with us it's that you recognize this is good and holy but i still struggle with it i can't yeah without grace and I will not never be perfect in this life. Yeah. One of St. Augustine's best quotes on this topic and it's quoted in our confessions, but it's from his retractions where he says, uh, we fulfill the law in that, uh, what we have failed to keep is forgiven. Right. And, um, that's how we're keepers of the law is that we begin to keep what we can by, grace and that what we have failed to keep us forgiven by god and therefore we're perfect law keepers now so what i'm hearing <laughs> from augustine there is that we're forgiven because we ask mary to appease christ yes okay thanks well let's let's continue let's see if he quotes augustine on that because he does mention augustine i'm very curious I meaning that's yeah probably he, what he's he, talking about. he probably quotes yeah he, what he means by quoting augustine is like oh augustine said mary was holy <laughs> yeah would say whoa 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 easy and then you say no this is saint alphonsus doctor of moral theology what belongs to the king says saint alphonsus also belongs to the queen and god has willed that you have not just a queen 
but a queen who's also your personal mother. This book will edify you. This book will strengthen you. It will fill you with the wisdom and the insights of the saints. So along that line, though, I mean, there's the language in the scripture, of course, of, you know, our father who art in heaven. Now you have our mother, right? Yeah. Because yep. isn't, isn't there language somewhere? It might have been Maximilian Colby. It might have been somebody else who basically says Mary is a kind of quasi-marital union with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. The spouse of the Holy Spirit, yeah. It's not dogmatized for the record, and somebody could say it's not dogmatized. I, I know it's not, but nonetheless, it's a, from my understanding, it is a tolerated opinion. Oh, 100%. I think I think John Paul II might have even been supporting it. I could be yeah, wrong on that. It's definitely, a, I mean, I know this guy says something like that. <laughs> he probably does. You know, it's kind of like when, when Skoda says, basically, whatever we can predicate of Mary that's good, we should. It's <laughs> whatever this guy can predicate that seems good of Mary, he will. Yeah, it's like, oh, why stop with just she's omnipotent by grace? Like, why not say she's omniscient? That's how she can know, you know, the desires of our hearts and all that stuff, too. Why not? Right. <laughs> they have, <laughs> just, I, they have the communication of divine attributes, but to Mary. What's that? They're, 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 they have a really good Lutheran Christology, but it's just to Mary. Yeah, exactly. Like she, she's in our souls because she's given omnipresence and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's great. <laughs> oh, the greatest sorry. saints. And again, doctor of the church, this is a very valuable piece of literature. Now, I'm going to be full disclosure. I do recommend you read this, you pray with it, you write in it, you underline it. But I also listen to this on a regular basis as an audiobook. When I'm getting ready in the morning, I have my audiobook playing and I'm listening to it. That's good. That's good. But I will be the first to tell you, audiobook is not the same as reading. When you sit down to read, something happens in the brain. God communicates in a special way through reading, especially when you're reading it with a sense of his presence. The glories of Mary. Read it. I know it is thicker. Audiobook it if you must. But this is so, so valuable. The fourth book. Now, this is where we take a departure from normal. All these previous books were the writings of saints. The next two books were not written by saints, but they have the teaching of one of the greatest Mariologists to ever live. St. Maximilian Kolbe is arguably one of saint. the greatest Mariologists of Well, I think maybe he's going to say that this contains the teachings of, of Maximilian Kolbe. Not that this was written by him. Okay. I think that's it. But one thing it made me think of before I forget is, you know, you have these developments of Mariology. It makes me think of, I think there was a time, it might have been Scott Hahn. I, I, it might have been somebody else who's like, yeah, Josephology, it's a burge, It's a like new field. It's like they just yeah, kind yeah. of admit, like, they're just making half of this stuff up. Yeah, why not? I mean, because, like, they'll, they'll say things like, oh, well, Mary was the Ark of the Covenant. And then I come back, it's like, oh, well. Maybe that means Joseph was Moses who carried the ark. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. Why not? I mean, we, let's just go, you know, like the, the sky's the limit, you know? Yeah, it really is. Theology, his study of the Holy Spirit, his pneumatology, his study of the Holy Spirit in relationship to the Virgin Mary, his radical total consecration revolutionizes Mariology, in my opinion. St. Louis de Montfort talked about holy slavery, total consecration. Absolutely. St. Maximilian Colby says, yes, and to the maximum, as far to the right as possible, as far to the right as theologically allowed, let's take it there. And it's revolutionary, and it's systematic, and it's beautiful, and it's full of zeal. There's a religious community called the Franciscan. I'm just curious, like he talks about to the far right of what's allowed, like what, what would he not allow? Like this guy. Yeah, exactly. Like that's a great question. I mean, I, I would love to know his boundary. I'd love to. Well, I'd love to assent, say like, you can't assent that she's the divine essence. Yeah, that's, that's probably what mass, he'd say. You can't accept she's the divine essence, but okay. hey, look, she has all of the properties of the divine essence by grace. Yeah. But, but okay, she, besides the incommunicable, because I, I, I just in ten years watch him start saying Mary's absolutely simple, like. <laughs> <laughs> watch him start saying stuff like that'd be really funny yeah it's sort of like it it also kind of like waters down the the uniqueness of the incarnation you know it's it does like, if like what 
I mean, if Mary has all these things that Jesus and his humanity has, it doesn't seem very special anymore. But Right. Anyway. Skin Friars of the Immaculate. And they dedicated their lives to living this Colbian Mariology, this Marian maximalism. As part of their religious vows, they take a Marian vow. So the book that I'm going to recommend to you is number four as a must read. The goal being be as holy as possible, be as Marian as possible, to be as Christ-like as possible. So that's the goal of this book. They take a Marian vow. This book is meant for those taking vows as a consecrated religious. I am not a consecrated religious. Most of you are not consecrated religious, but I strongly endorse this book. I strongly encourage this book because it captures the zeal and the spirit of Maximilian Kolbe in a way that I have never encountered anywhere else. From these pages oozes zeal for the Virgin Mary. From these pages oozes Maximilian Kolbe's Marian maximalism. He says things like, we should desire to be transubstantiated into the Immaculata. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just sounds like the, that sounds like something I would m make up. You know what I mean? That sounds like, you, you know how there's the, 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 um, Zoomer speak? Like, you know, the, the language that's like, you gotta get the rizzed up. Like, <laughs> the Catholic, you gotta get transubstantiated <laughs> into the Immaculata. This is like Dracula flow Catholic version. Yeah, it's like in, uh, well, yeah, being conformed to the image of Christ is cool, but ever tried to be substanti transubstantiated into Mary? <laughs> it's just like, well, that's the thing is they're adding all this stuff where they're, I mean, I just got to be honest, there's so much you have to do. And one of the best things about Lutheranism, I truly think, and, and not that like the Reformed and other groups don't do this, but one of the things that I found in Lutheranism that I really appreciate is very much this language in Luther about how the daily works that you do, you are worshiping God in them. There's not this secret work you have to look for. You don't have to act and figure out what's what's the thing God wants the most from me. No, it's very much just mm -hmm. live out your vocation, do the things that God commands in his Ten Commandments as best you can. And yeah, you're, you are pleasing to God in that way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 100%. I mean, it's, it's weird because they're like, well, if you want to be more like Jesus, you got to be like Mary first. So in order to, so this is how the walk of sanctification works. I need to become as Marian as possible first, and then I need to worry about being like Jesus second, which is yeah. already impossible to be like Jesus, but, you know. Well, yeah, and that's the problem, um, because what you're doing is, you, well, you're adding a ton of stuff that you have to do, and, you know, I don't think he, in these videos, I... I'm sure I, you know, I've seen like Catholics online say stuff like, if you don't have devotion to Mary, you can't be saved. I've seen that before. <laughs> yeah. But like, again, I, I'd love to see proof of the first four centuries of anything close to this occurring. Um, but what, what goes on is that's just not the language of the text at all. Like the language of Paul and of Christ is basically just worship God, follow the commandments. That's pretty much it. Like live out your daily <laughs> life, dude. Yeah, it's like it's like weird because they'll say like, "Oh, this is why you need Mary because she turns the heart of God." But it's like, well, doesn't Jesus say things like, "If you pray to the Father in my name, it will be given unto you"? Yeah. Well, apparently, that's meaningless. Like right. Catholic theologians actually will say, "Oh, well, that verse actually is meaningless because it doesn't mean anything relevant." Hmm. I've not heard that one before. Like, I mean, that's what the only response. That's the only like conceivable response i could think of like most of the time when i bring up that verse in these conversations they'll just be like oh so you're saying you can just ask for literally anything <laughs> and it's oh, like well you're not yeah. it's like you're not taking this seriously are you right like, well they're not taking it seriously because when those when those words are said they're said in the context of christ for one asking for things of god they're saying that yes. you're conforming your will to god like when james talks about this stuff like james one james is actually one of my favorite books of scripture for the record you know it's funny there's the stereotype luke can say james no i love james it's great yeah uh, it yeah. talks about how we should pray for wisdom god will mm -hmm. grant it. like that's the stuff i think is in the context it's not oh, yeah you pray for like a thousand dollars every five seconds yeah right no like all of our prayers in saint augustine and luther are so great on this 
um, all of our prayer life is sort of modeled after the contents of like the Lord's prayer. Right. So like, that's like one of the main reasons Jesus gives us the Lord's prayer when the disciples like, how should we pray? Well, the Lord's prayer sort of contains everything in it. That is like something that the, that's in conformity with God's will that the believer should actively and consistently pray for. Right. You know, stuff like that. So. And and notice that the things prayed for are pretty like normal, so to speak. Yeah. Like, not, not in a way that they're not supernatural, mysterious and so on, but that they're, they're not like God transubstantiate me into the Immaculata, but they're very much just God help me forgive those who I need to and forgive me yeah. as I do so. And, yeah. you know, every you know, day, make sure, the... you know, God, please make sure that I don't, you know, when you ask God for your daily bread, you ask God to bless those who, uh, you know, who are in your society to help you get the food you get. And also ask God to help you survive and not die, you know, like just very general things. Like you don't have to ask God for like more than you need. That's the whole point of the Lord's prayer is you're praying for what you need. Right. Right. So let's continue. That it is no longer I who live, but that it is Mary who lives through me. Ah, there we are. Galatians 2.20, but Marian. (laughs) It's not, you know, it's not I who, it was it I, it's not I who lives. I can't remember it. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Yes, right. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, something like that. But no, now it's Mary. Now it's Mary who's living in you. Like, how do you not see this as absolutely insane? Because it's not like he has to like either he is a complete moron and he has no clue this is Galatians two twenty or he's completely aware of what he's doing just quite literally replacing Christ with Mary. Yeah, yeah. either one it's just reprehensible. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what's funny about it is that's a passage that say like Cajetan and a lot of Catholics will use to talk about their view of grace and justification. That Cajetan has rendered it. You know, I mean, he doesn't render this as though he's translating, but this is the explanation is it's not no longer I who work, but Christ works in me. Like Christ is the one working through you. So now it's, you know, Mary is the one, if you're to apply this to Cajetan's interpretation, now it's Mary is working through you for your salvation. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy to me. Okay. I give her my hands. I give her my feet. I'm not just her slave. I'm her instrument. I am everything. I am all Mary to the maximum. I want Mary to walk this earth again in and through me so that Christ can come alive into the world. So this is as far to the right as possible without crossing over the line. Thanks be to God. Maximilian Colby was a brilliant theologian. So in this book, The Marian Vow, that spirit is captured. There's a lot here that you're going to ignore. The parts about being a consecrated religious don't apply to me. So you know what I do? I skip over it. But what you will gain from reading this book is a passionate, zealous zeal that you can only experience if you spent time with Maximilian Colby. Because he's dead, I can't spend time with him. But I I feel his end. Unless you pray to him, right? Like he talks about Mary speaking to you. Why can't you with Maximilian Colby in? Yeah, well, you know what's funny about this is like Catholics will say, "Oh, we're only pr- we should only pray to saints. We can't just pray to anyone." And it's like, "Well, how does someone get sainted?" Oh, well, they get recognized. Oh, there has to be all these miracles confirmed of people praying to them and their prayers answered. It's like, oh, so you start. <laughs> that's, yeah, like, that's a good okay. point. That is really strange. It's so backwards. It's like. You can literally just start praying to anybody in Catholicism. Like, I can, apparently, you know, it's like, because there's no dogmatic statements on anyone in hell. So, like, I mean, I guess as a Catholic, I can just pray to Luther, you know, so. <laughs> base? <laughs> base? No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, Luther, I go up there, like, I got a miracle by praying to Luther, help. Yeah, Luther would shoot you if you started praying to him. <laughs> yeah, probably. What are you doing? You know. <laughs> <laughs> But that shows he was more, you know, he had the theology of the cross glory distinction, you know, like he recognized like, oh, the Christian should never desire to be like treated in the way that Catholics treat the saints. <laughs> well, that's actually a good point is we don't, I mean, to be fair, I don't think they're going to say oh, Mary lived her life trying to look for this, but Jesus receives it. But I mean, that kind of is a way in which they're talking about sainthood is when you're a saint, this is what you can do. And isn't it your desire to be a saint? Like, yeah, exactly. Like your desire is for like glory and greatness. 
Like that's the whole urge to be a saint is that you want to be like great. You don't want to just be in like the lower levels of glory in heaven. You want to be at the highest level of glory, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, really... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go no, go ahead. Well, I was, I'm just really curious to see what, what's in the book. He says he skips over stuff that doesn't have to do with him in the religious life because he's not like a Franciscan. I'd be curious as to what's specifically in there for it. Uh, because this is, yeah. again, one of those things that Luther talks about. And it's much, it's not the case today as much by any means, but like the religious life of back then was wildly different from everything else. Like you just fundamentally, there were these special works that the religious could, the religious life, the monks could do that the average person couldn't, which is part of what yeah. made them superior. I'd be very curious to see what specific things are recommended in this. I mean, if it's basic stuff, like when you're with your, you know, the other monks and the friars do whatever like that you know, whatever, that, that doesn't defeat a point. And this isn't an, uh, even an argument. It's just, I'd be curious to see it. I doubt yeah. it's just purely practical stuff of like, when you're, you know, leading the mass, do X, Y, Z. I imagine it's stuff that in theory, anybody could do, but I don't know. That's just conjecture. Energy. I feel his passion in this book. So that's why I strongly encourage you to read the Marian vow in this order. Again, the secret of Mary, the secret of the rosary, the glories of Mary, to fill your mind with that theology, this book to fill your heart with passion and zeal, and then the final book that I have as a must read, fills your mind with how to do it. So the Marian vow fills your heart with zeal for Our Lady, to become one with Our Lady, to live a life in the presence of Mary, to live a life of union with Mary. And the fifth book is called Life of Union with Mary by Father Emile Nuber. Pause, there's a, a little bit of a backstory I need to give you. you can Father keep Emile Nuber was one yeah, of the fine. favorite Mariologists of St. Maximilian Kolbe. So St. Maximilian Kolbe, who John Paul II called the prophet of the new millennium, the prophet of today, this was his favorite author, Father Emile Nuber. Maximilian Kolbe, imbibed him, drank in his writings. So we are going to drink from the same wellspring that Maximilian Kolbe drank. But I'm going to give you two warnings about this book, two things to keep in your mind as you're reading it. Number one, this was the favorite author of Maximilian Kolbe to read. One of the flaws or one of the setbacks, I can't call it a flaw, it's not his fault. One of the setbacks that this book has is that Father Emile Nubert did not read Maximilian Kolbe. And so Father Emile Nuber does not have the same zeal, does not have the same fiery aura that the writings of Maximilian Kolbe does. So you have to read this with a certain sense of get through it. Get through it. Why? Because this is the practicality. The other one was the heart. This is the how-to. So sometimes a how-to book isn't as uh, page-turning as a heart book. But I give you my word, the steps laid here in this book by Father Emile Nuber on how to have a life of union with Mary are so critically important, and he lays them out in a systematic way. How to have a conversation with Mary, how to have a sense of the presence of Mary, how to do the will of I just always laugh at this because it, it reminds me of so much of the charismatics with how they treat God. Like, oh, how do you have a conversation with God? Because you should expect it. You know, how to do the will of God, you have to figure what that is, figure out what that is, you know? Hey, yeah, how do I know I'm feeling Mary's presence and not something else? Well, again, what I, what I wonder is specifically, what is the will of Mary, so to speak? I mean, I, the, the true will of Mary, of course, I would just say is that we say what that we do what Christ says, you know, follow. Yeah, exactly. Follow He's like, listen to whatever he tells you, right? Uh, that's yeah. what Mary's will is. Do whatever Jesus tells us to do. Yeah. And Jesus tells us to come to him and pray to him. And... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm honoring Mary by just be- doing whatever Jesus tells me to do, which is to obey the law and to trust in him for my salvation. That's all I got to do. Yeah. I don't have a problem so, with that. No, none of this nonsense. Right. <laughs> Mary. One of the major things that's missing in most people's total consecration, they give Mary their merits. They give Mary their life, their health, their wealth. So you give Mary your merits. Isn't the whole point of merits that you're that you're looking for that towards God because God's the one who justifies? Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. Who, uh, you know, it's not it's Mary to the max, and it's uh, you know not idolatry. 
It's just veneration, Tony. I sorry, I also just love this is a perfect screen right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the 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 thumbnail in this video, I, I mean it sounds it's gonna sound mean, but it makes me laugh every time. When I'll I see we'll it. have to look back at it. Yeah, yeah. They give Mary that stuff, but you know what they don't give her? Their will. And the will is the most integral part of giving yourself to somebody. To give Mary my will, what do you want of me, Mary? This book helps you to have a sense. What does Mary want of me? So Life of Union with Mary. But I did mention that there was a second thing to keep in mind when reading Father Emil Newbear's wonderful, beautiful, amazing book, in that when he talks about the rosary, no offense to him, he did not read this. It's very evident. Many people are not educated on the rosary. So that's why we have already strengthened ourselves by reading the secret of the rosary by St. Louis de Montfort. So Life of Union with Mary, I come back to this book more than any other Marian book. This is the book of the practical ways to living a life of union with Mary. It's gold. All right, now let's get to those bonus books. They're not Ooh. necessarily must bonus read. Round. These are bonuses, the Immaculate Conception <laughs> and the Holy Spirit, the Roman Conferences, Devotion to Our Lady, the Mystical City of God by Venerable Mary of Agreda. So I told you there'd only be four bonus. I can't have a video on spiritual classics and must read Marian books without mentioning True Devotion by St. Louis de Montfort. There are many great Marian books. Just because they're not on my list doesn't mean that I don't like them. I would love to hear what are your favorite Marian books. Put those in the comments. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see. Any uh, any books you want to add to the comments, Tony? <laughs> um, James White has a book called Mary Another Redeemer? Question mark. That I think it's pretty good. <laughs> Oh gosh! Today you've recommended James White and Mike w Mike Winger. I, I think we have to kick you off the channel at this point. Man. Well, you know, I will. You know, it'd be nice. It'd actually be kind of interesting if some Lutherans would actually write on this topic. But no, know. I know. I think I'd be curious as I'm reading Hallats. Uh, I'm finishing up Quenstead right now. Uh, and for those of you who are getting a, who are watching this, because I'm going to release this the week I'm recording it, I'm, I hope to make a video that's summarizing this out of print work of Johannes Quenstedt on the nature and character of theology. So, um, but point is, I, I'd be curious to see if either Quenstedt or uh, Hallatz writes on it. I mean, I mean, Chemnitz in the first volume, I believe, the examination he he uh, touches on a Marian stuff, but he obviously is not, you know, around when this crazy stuff is happening. So he's not quite there with Maximilian hey. Colby and all that. So, but let's can, do two final me? things. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, no, I got a phone call. Sorry. It kicked me out for a second. Oh, you're okay. Um, the final thing, let's just look at these comments here. Yeah. Look, when I was 15 years old, my religion, I was seventh day Adventist. After I got a miracle from Mama Mary, I decided to be Catholic. It's like, Let's see. Yeah, like look at all this stuff. I mean, look how many this is. I mean, there's so much here. I also love this, like <laughs> to Jesus through Mary, to Mary through Jesus. <laughs> I just love that. For the final thing, can you read us one of those prayers? I don't know if you have it on hand. Yeah, so this is um I think it's by St. Lou de Montfort or not I guess saint honestly. But uh this is uh the prayer of like consecration that every Catholic says in their total consecration to Jesus through Mary. Um and so this is what that one video Gabby was going over with the 33 days uh -huh. um, that he was prepping everyone for. So this is the consecratory prayer they have to say, like, at the start of it. Um, and this is just kind of, like, telling to show, like, um, like, this is what they're having these people pray. Um, this isn't, like, you know, a game, like – this is like serious business for these people. Yeah. Like we're, we're, um, we were laughing. We're having fun talking about it, but this stuff is legitimately really serious. 
Like there, yeah. there are things I've talked to Stephen Kozar about this one. There are times when you just have to, like, there are times you just have to laugh because there's nothing else you can do. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so I guess we'll start it off here. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is the, the words of consecration. Um, so it starts off saying, I give thee thanks. Uh, this is talking to God first, and then it's going to go to Mary. I give thee thanks for thou has annihilated thyself, taking the form of a slave in order to rescue me from the cruel slavery of the devil. I praise and glorify thee for thou hast been pleased to submit thyself to Mary, thy holy mother in all things, in order to make me thy faithful slave through her. But alas, and grateful and faithless I have been, I have not kept the promises which I made so solemnly to thee in my baptism. I have not fulfilled my obligations. I do not deserve to be called thy child, nor yet thy slave. And as there is nothing in me which does not merit thine anger and thy repulse, I dare not come by myself before thy most holy and august majesty. It is on this account that I have recourse to the intercession of thy most holy mother, whom thou hast given me for a mediatrix with you. It is through her that I hope to attain of the contrition, the pardon of my sins, and the acquisition and preservation of wisdom. Um, Hail then, O Immaculate Mary, living tabernacle of the divinity, where the eternal wisdom willed to be hidden and to be adored by angels and by men. Hail, O Queen of heaven and earth, to whose empire everything is subject, which is under God. Hail, O sure refuge of sinners, whose mercy fails no one. Hear the desires which I have of the divine wisdom, and for that end, receive the vows and offerings in my loneliness I present to you. I, blank, you say your name, a faithless sinner, renew and ratify today in thy hands the vows of my baptism. I renounce forever Satan, his pomps and works. I give myself entirely to Jesus Christ uh, to carry my cross after him all the days of my life and to be more faithful to him than I've ever been before. In the presence of all the heavenly court, I chose thee this day for my mother and mistress. I deliver and consecrate to thee as thy slave, my body and soul, mm -hmm. my goods, both interior and exterior, and even the value of all my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to thee the entire and full right of disposing of me and all that belongs to me without exception, according to thy good pleasure." Receive, O benignant virgin, uh, the, this little offering of my slavery and honor and in union with that subjection with the eternal wisdom and homage to the power which both you and over you have over this poor sinner and thanksgiving for the privileges which the Holy Trinity has favored thee. Um, I declare that I, which henceforth as thy true slave to seek honor and to obey thee in all things. Uh, oh, admirable mother, present me to thy dear son, um, so that he has redeemed me by thee, by thee he may receive me. O oh, mother of mercy, grant me the grace to obtain the true wisdom of God. Um, yada, yada, yada. Uh, o oh, faithful virgin, make me in all things a perfect disciple. Yeah, amen. So, but yeah, as part of that, you have to off your entire soul and your body and every good thing you've ever done to Mary. You're offering it all as a sacrifice to her and giving it to her. Um, and also in the prayer, you're like, oh, Jesus, I dare not to come to you, uh, right. but I give recourse to Mary. <laughs> yeah. So, Again, um, it's so, it's saddening because I mean, it's it's serious because those who are putting this out are putting out false doctrine, but it's really saddening because they're saying multiple things. One, that there are these secret ways of salvation they have to basically find by reading a bunch of these special books. Not that I'm opposed to reading books by any means, of course. I, I'm going to say if you want to understand theology, like here are a bunch of systematics you should read. But it's very much this language of, oh, if you want to be a really holy Christian, you've got to read this one. This is what you got to do first. You know what I mean? Like it's the, here's your step-by-step -step way of doing it. And only some people can do it. And he talks about how some people don't do it well enough and all this stuff. Right. Um, and of course we could talk about degrees of sanctification and things that help your sanctification, but it's different. I think than just basically, Oh, here are the books that have all the secrets. Um, and then 
it, it's telling you like, hey, Jesus doesn't want to hear you. Like he doesn't want to. He hates you practically. Yeah. Like he, I mean, they, they're not going to say that. Of course, they're going to say, oh, Jesus loves you. But it's like, really? No, he wants to judge you. He wants to judge you. You have to go to Mary and convince God that he shouldn't do it. This is a language. So it's really sad. I, I hate that we have well, to make videos on this kind of stuff. It's kind of interesting, but like, this is going to sound weird, but some of what he's saying actually sounds somewhat Protestant and that what they're doing is they're setting up Mary as the grounds of their like acceptance before God, like, <laughs> like we do in our theology about Jesus. Right. So he says things, there's nothing in me, which does not merit thine anger and thy repulse. Yeah. So I need Mary to, uh, and her merits on my behalf. And it's like, wait, this is literally just what, protestants say about jesus <laughs> that's what i've that's what i've said to people before is like i'll see these catholics argue against against imputed righteousness not only like it's not scriptural which it is scriptural but also like oh it's metaphysically impossible and then at the same time they're like oh yeah, yeah but here are the here are the merits of these saints that i can apply to myself through the treasury of merit oh well you see what happens is is that their merits get infused into us which is just like, and that makes perfect sense, right? Just don't think about it. Yeah, just don't think about it. Your merits are infused. Their merits are infused, so their merits become yours. But it's not the same as imputation. No, because apparently, when their merits are infused, it makes it to where God is like, "Oh, you apparently did all the same same things they did," but actually, not really, because that doesn't make sense. But what we're saying is that. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, but. they just can't do it. Well, I think this video has been uh, long enough. Do you have any final final thoughts on it? Um, yeah, uh, I guess, um, like, again, I guess uh, we didn't make this video to, you know, bash or belittle Mary in any way. But in, in all honesty, like, the best way that we can actually show honor and reverence to a great saint like Mary is to actually do what she wants us to do, which is to trust and follow her son and everything and and his word and what he tells us to do for our life and salvation is sufficient. And uh, all this other stuff is just, it's dishonoring to Jesus, it's dishonoring to Mary. Um, and it's just sad to see like, you know, a lot of Catholics will say this isn't, uh, what I would love to see from Catholics if they really think that this stuff's a problem, which it obviously is, is that they should actually take this seriously and get these books by, you know, Louis de Montfort and Alfonso Sigori taken off the record as like heretical. But of course, they never do it. They can't do that because they're declared saints. Yeah. So and and uh, Alfonso is a doctor. Yeah. So. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't really have any other, I don't really have too much to add there besides, uh, you know, it's a glory. I, I We have a great comfort that we can go to Christ, that we don't have to say Mary will hear us and convince God. No, Christ is, you know, he is quick to his mercy. He loves us and I have no fear of him. I go to the throne of grace boldly. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, so many great things by Jesus when he talks about prayer. He's like, if, you know, God will do this for Oh, he talk, when when he talks about how even an evil parent will give their child gifts, how much more will God, your father in heaven, right. bless you? And it's just like the picture that Jesus paints of God is one of like acceptance and mercy and love and comfort. You can trust him and go to him for everything. And you can trust in him to answer his prayers because he's promised to. And with all this Mary devotion stuff just takes us away from that comfort. So mm -hmm. anyway. I, uh, I'm going to get going. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, thanks for making it through this long video, but we think it was a good one. We'll uh, catch yep. you all later. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching another Scholastic Lutherans video. If you'd like to support us, you can follow us on Twitter at Gerhard's Ghost or contribute on Patreon at Scholastic Lutherans. There you'll get access to our Telegram chat and other perks. Links can be found in the description. Subscribe, like, or leave a comment, and have a nice day.